Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. This is Jim McKeith, and this is Web Front End Frameworks. So my name is Jim McKeith. I'm the lead worldwide developer evangelist and engineer with Embarcadero Technologies. Also the host of the podcast at Delphi.org, which as of Monday this week has new episodes. So there's a new episode on there. Uh, Nick Hodges is now my co-host. So check that out for the latest Delphi and Embarcadero news and views. Uh, new episodes will be coming out weekly. So another, expect another episode on Monday. So our agenda today is we're going to talk about web frameworks, uh, look at both back-end frameworks and front-end frameworks, and then we're going to look at JavaScript as well as transpilers, obfuscators, minification, some JavaScript frameworks, and then we're going to have some examples of some frameworks. And uh, so let's talk about platforms. We're all familiar with uh, Delphi really started out with uh, Windows as its main as its platform is supported, and then over the few years we've expanded to Win32, Win64, Android, iOS, and macOS, with Linux coming soon. Now, when we talk about the platforms Delphi supports, that's what we think about. But the reality is, Delphi also supports web browsers. It's had web frameworks quite a while, uh, some built in, some that come with it as well, or uh, by third parties. So that's what we're going to look at today is these web frameworks that let you build apps that run in the browser. So web frameworks are frameworks and libraries that make it easy to work with the web and related technologies. So in a broader sense, things like Indy and the REST client library in DataSnap are also web frameworks, although we don't really think of them as such, but REST is based on web technology, HTTP. Uh, interweb and web broker are more of a traditional web framework in that they are uh, specifically around building web browsers. And so that's what we're going to look at today is this category of things where you're building applications that are run in the web browser, uh, not so much into the REST uh, technologies, even though, like I said, those are technically don't do fall into web frameworks. So just talk a little bit about the, the web stack, where the different pieces of things go. There is the internet server. So on the internet server, there's a database, some sort of data persistence. There's HTML documents as well as images and other types of documents. Then there's the server side processing, which is the CGIs and the SAPIs. Now, when you're using like a web broker, you're building a CGI or a SAPI that uh, resides in the web server to do some sort of processing and connect to a database and combine data from the database with an HTML document, for example, that then the web server can then serve up via HTTPS or HTTP. The web browser on the client side, it, can, it only understands HTML cascading style sheets in JavaScript, and to a limited extent, JSON and XML as well. But generally speaking, if you're talking about web browser, you're talking about HTML cascading style sheets in JavaScript. So uh, also you can, have, like I said, REST clients are part of the our web framework as well. So web uh, uh, another REST client using like the REST client library could talk to a REST API via HTTP and JSON to uh, interact with that as well. Now, the server-side processing can also talk to REST APIs on other services, kind of creating a, a service-oriented architecture or microservices. Um, so anyway, this is kind of just an overview of the different technologies and where they belong. So like I said, the if you're building a Delphi application, typically you're building something that does server-side processing, and then you're using other technologies to do the HTML cascading style sheets XML, uh, even if it's like a, a HTML5 builder or something like that. But what we're gonna look at today is ways you can take your skills, your Delphi skills, and put those into the web browser so that you're building uh, for the web browser directly. And now I'm, I'm talking about Delphi here, but there's some of the stuff also, or a lot of stuff actually will cover C++ builder. So if you are a C++ builder developer, uh, I apologize. I did make an effort to uh, include C++ as well and point out where it is supported. But uh, some of it is going to be Delphi specific, but I may use uh, Delphi as a descriptive 
noun, where I mean uh, C++ and Delphi both. So some of the technologies here, we have, uh, hopefully you know these, but real quick overview. HTML is the hypertext markup language, which is used to mark up and present media. So it inserted, you use HTML5 in text to make the text interactive, hypertext, as well as to embed media and links and stuff like that. XML, uh, not typically part of it, or not something we usually assume as part of the web stack is text for it's similar to html both of them are based on um what is it, sgml which is standard general markup language uh, xml's extensible markup language that is used to mark up data so it's designed for data not necessarily to be presented to humans but you can provide a style sheet css on xml to turn xml into something user designed for user readable so style sheets cascading style sheets define the layout and style. So when HTML first came out, you had a lot more style type elements injected into HTML, but now the way it's, the recommended way of going is to have the um, stylistic elements in cascading style sheets. Now those can be a separate file or they can be injected into the HTML. Best practices are to have them as a separate file. Then for the, so that we have HTML is the data, cascading style sheets is the presentation, and then JavaScript is the functionality. It's a scripting language that you can use that is executed inside the browser or elsewhere to uh, provide functionality. And then lastly, JSON, which is more used in um, REST, is the JavaScript object notation. So it's based on the way uh, JavaScript stores objects and streams objects. So here are some examples of backend frameworks, which are what you use to build server-side functionality. So this is the functionality that's going to reside in the cloud. Uh, RAD server and DataSnap are examples of building uh, REST servers. They both are uh, included with RAD Studio, Delphi, C++ Builder. A web broker is a it provides the backend functionality, but then gives you the ability to embed uh, CSS, HTML, JavaScript, etc. So a web broker, which has been part of uh, Delphi and C++ Builder for years, I'm trying to what version is, I should have looked it up, but for quite a while, a number of years, is it's actually a pretty powerful technology. It's similar to uh, ASP.net or ASP, um, the way ASP tags work, but it allows you to embed this uh, or extend HTML to make it so you can have this functionality, so you can inject data into it, stuff like that. A SOAP server is also a web backend framework, although we don't see SOAP near as often as we used to. It's also built into uh, Delphi, C++ Builder, and RAD Studio. Some third-party backend frameworks is the Delphi MVC framework. I know a lot of people love this. It's an open source framework by Daniele Tete, and it is a really powerful framework for building REST servers. Uh, Synops has the Mormit, M-O-R-M-O-T, which is a client server ORM, object relational mapping um, SOAP MVC framework. Href has their web hub, which is a straight driven database friendly framework and there's other ones out there as well so these are all really focused on the back end um, although i will point out right now that a lot of the lines i'm drawing in here as far as differentiation between front ends and back ends and stuff like that are a little fuzzy some of them definitely do cross the lines uh, but just for general classifications right now so mvc framework is is like i said is designed to build restful apis it has a Delphi IDE wizard to simplify your development process. It has uh, session support. It's extendable using middleware, so it can hook into other middleware uh, for REST, and requ REST requests and responses. And it supports CORS, C-O-R-S, which is cross-origin resource sharing. Now, what this is, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, used to be it was really easy if you uh, had a web page, you could just inject scripts from different sites, and that was all hunky-dory and nothing to worry about. And then somebody got creative and realized, hey, I can uh, add a little HTML to your web page, maybe by, through a comment on your forum software, and pull in some malicious JavaScript from another website and 
compromise your website. So everybody visiting your website gets my malicious script ran. And so then they started coming up with all the browsers started becoming more restrictive about where scripts could be pulled in and said, okay, I'll only pull in scripts from the origin site. So if I'm visiting uh, Embarcadero.com, only pull in scripts from Embarcadero.com. We can't pull in scripts from Bill and Ted's excellent script emporium, for example. But the problem is, is sometimes you want to pull scripts in from other sources. And so they came up with cores, cross-origin resource sharing, which is a way of saying, okay, I want to be able to pull scripts in from other sites. Yes, I know. I trust Bill and Ted's script emporium, so we're going to pull in scripts from there, and that's fine. Uh, So that's what cores is, and that's an important element of uh, web development. It also has basic authentication support. You can find out more. There's the URL down at the bottom where you can check it out on GitHub. I'm not Mormot. Mormot. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correct. Right. It's essentially like Marmot. That's why they have a little Marmots for their uh, mascot there, but with an O instead of an A. Uh, it's a uh, ORM persistence framework. It works against any database uh, to build service-oriented architecture. It actually has the uh, some client technology in there as well, like WebMVC. It's licensed under... Uh, MPL, GPL, and LGPL try license. Uh, so you can check a look at that there. Synops.info for the uh, more information on Mormot. So WebHub, HREF WebHub. This is the uh, another backend framework that gives you automatic state saving without the need for cookies. And so it's it's pretty cool. It's been around for a while. I uh, did some work with some of Ahrefs tools a while back. Uh, you can find out more. Uh, at They did a Code Rage 9 session on WebHub. You can take a look at it there, which was really cool, really well put together session. Um, for it, it talks about how you can use uh, WebHub to build database-driven applications, uh, supports connecting to uh, lots of... Uh, the technology is built into Rad Studio, Delphi, and C++ Builder, like DataSnap, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about web front-end frameworks. These are frameworks that are designed to make it easier for you to render in the browser. This is where you're going to do the browser functionality. Um, so you're using Delphi or some sort of other visual designers to create a visual layout. So you don't need to know HTML, CSS, or JavaScript necessarily, although if you do know them, you can use them frequently to extend the uh, functionality of the application, maybe create your own components, et cetera. Now, some of these use their own separate designers. So they're actually a separate standalone product product from uh, Delphi and C++ Builder, and you can use them as such, but they are frequently, well, first of all, everything I'm going to show you here, either... um, supports a Delphi-like or C++-like scripting language within it so that your skill set is compatible, but also they support um, DataSnap or the REST server or something like that. So they're designed to extend your existing infrastructure. So if you've already got a DataSnap server and you're like, oh, I really need a web front end, and you're like, well, maybe I should go learn JavaScript. No, you don't need to learn JavaScript. That's what these are for. Use these to build a front end on your existing data snap server. Uh, so they operate in the browser, no special client plugins required like uh, Silverlight or Flash or anything like that. This is just a building native HTML. I say native, even though JavaScript is kind of the unnative, but it's native to the web. Uh, some of these frameworks b- build both a client and server. Some of them are just Pascal to JavaScript transpilers. So you write JavaScript, or write Pascal, Object Pascal Delphi, and it creates JavaScript from that, and it all runs in the browser. There's no backend built into the tool. Although, like I said, you can then have it consume data snap or um, RAD server or something like that. So it you're creating both sides of it. So what is a transpiler? A transpiler is a translating compiler or a source-to-source compiler. So typically the idea with a transpiler is it's translating source code from one language to another or is taking source code from a higher level language to a lower level language. So uh, um, frequently this is used around JavaScript. JavaScript is 
kind of a cool language. doesn't have any type safety in it. doesn't have a number of things in it. So there's lots of transpilers that support JavaScript, making JavaScript kind of the assembly language of the web, which is pretty effective since it is the only language that actually runs on the web itself. So TypeScript and CoffeeScript are two really popular JavaScript transpilers. Uh, CoffeeScript was I think, probably one of the first ones. It probably wasn't the first one, but one of the first big ones. And then TypeScript was uh, Microsoft. Uh, Anders Halsberg designed TypeScript. And if you don't know who Anders Halsberg was, he was one of the original architects behind uh, Turo Pascal and Delphi. Uh, one down, so some downsides to transpilers is if you're using a transpiler from an existing language like Delphi or C++ Builder to a to JavaScript is it's usually a subset of that existing language. It doesn't support everything or it supports a specific dialect of that original language. And the platform-specific libraries that are common to that language don't come across with it. Okay, so transpilers are a great way to leverage your skills, but you're not going to leverage your existing code because your existing code is going to be calling um, platform libraries, uh, whether it be visual components or whatever. So uh, really transpilers are about skill leveraging. So some Pascal to JavaScript transpilers, or some of these aren't exactly transpilers. There's two commercial ones here. Is One is SMS, which it was originally Smart Mobile Studio. They still call it Smart Mobile Studio, but it's really more focused now on um, cloud computing, as it were, whether it be like through Node.js or something along those lines. And it is a uh, Pascal transpiler. So you're writing in Pascal code. It's kind of based on Delphi. It has its own extensions, but then it creates JavaScript from that. Elevate Web Builder is another one from Elevate Soft that allows you to write in um, Pascal a Delphi dialect of Pascal, and then it transpiles that into JavaScript and creates a native uh, application that can, that can run within the browser, native to the browser, so it's JavaScript running within the browser. Some open source transpilers are out there. There's uh, ext Pascal, which it's not really a transpiler, but it was similar. There's P2JS and pass 2 js They're both out there open source. There are different stages of completion out there. Uh, different features each you can take a look at those and then Delphi web script which uh, is again kind of in the similar to a transpiler category uh, for, so can take a look at that one as well if you're looking for a way to write in Delphi but then have that run on uh, in the browser and in order to uh, create equal representation here are some C++ the JavaScript transpilers there's chirp and EMS Scripten, you can take a look at those there. Uh, they're both open source based on LLVM, and they compile C++ to JavaScript. Um, EMS Scripten uses, uh, compiles to a sim.js, which is a uh, essentially a library, an assembly level library for JavaScript, which is kind of bizarre. Although I saw somebody else was doing a I don't know, we'll get into that. Anyway, it's uh, so you compiles to the SimJS, which is a uh, open source JavaScript framework uh, representation of assembly. So anyway, so you can take a look at those if you want to use ways to uh, build or take your C++ skills. You're probably not going to really take any of your C++ code and move it to JavaScript the, because it doesn't have any C++ builder extensions or uh, any of the libraries we include. Now, things like some, maybe some C++ standard libraries maybe have some s support in there, but any of the libraries like the RTL, for example, are not going to uh, work on uh, with these transpilers. Uh, hey, hey, Bruce, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. And uh, B from Switzerland, hi. Great, great for you to join us. Now, everybody's going to want to send hi real quick, but had to say hi to Bruce. Uh, so here's some popular JavaScript frameworks. Now, I'm putting these here, not that you need to know a JavaScript framework, but just kind of to open a little bit of a dialogue about them here. Yep, everybody's saying hi. Hi from Quebec. Hi, Ural. Okay, um, so just so you know what they are, because you're going to see a lot of these other systems reference these JavaScript frameworks. So... Just when you do, then you'll know what, what they're talking about here. One thing about JavaScript frameworks, and because of the way JavaScript is, is a JavaScript framework 
fundamentally changes the way uh, you interact with JavaScript code. And so it's when you're developing for Node.js, you're not really, it's, it, yes, technically you're using JavaScript, but it's really a Node.js at that point. It can change, uh, it doesn't change the syntax, but it changes pretty much everything you do in JavaScript. JavaScript is a really malleable language in that way. So uh, it really fundamentally changes it. So Node.js is a server-side framework using Google's V8 engine. It actually includes its own package manager. It's supported on multiple platforms. Uh, really uh, a big system, Node.js. Uh, not really web browser related. It's more of the cloud related. Then React.js is around DOM manipulation. So DOM is the document object model, and that is uh, most often used as a way to uh, manipulate HTML. And so what that does, what, the do what DOM manipulation allows you to do is you create a, uh, you have a web page, and in the web page, the web page has a, is a document. And the DOM is the object that represents that document. And so with, uh, with the DOM manipulation, what you do is you are able to reference parts of the web page. And so you can say, hey, I want to change the um, paragraph tag with this ID to say this. And so you can actually change the text within the web page. Uh, and it was actually the first time I saw it, it was really quite uh, amazing because usually in HTML it's static, but JavaScript then changes that so that with through DOM manipulation to change it. Uh, Angular JS is by Google, a very popular one. It's the model view whatever MVW, and it's another extension to HTML. Uh, view AS or VJS is a library for building web interfaces, and Sensha ext JS is a cross-platform JavaScript web framework. So real quick, we're talking about code, obfuscation, and minification. This is something that comes up frequently in JavaScript. It um, can be used in other languages as well, but JavaScript is really the main place we're going to see it, or one of the places we're going to see it where we're talking about. Uh, obfuscation is changing code to make it harder to read, so it's a way of protecting the intellectual property of the code so that someone can't reverse engineer to get your logic back out. Minification, because JavaScript is downloaded as uh, JavaScript, as the uh, text minification removes unnecessary characters, shortens identifiers, makes it load faster. Now, one note is most web servers are going to use uh, compression, so it may not be a huge of impact because it should be compressed, but still useful to know. Okay, so now let's talk about visual design front end frameworks, and then we'll take a look at some of these in action. Uh, Andrew, so hold on a second. We'll be showing stuff, stuff in action here. There's Here's three of them that run in the IDE that create both the front end and the back end. IntraWeb by A to Z ships with Delphi C++ Builder and Rad Studio, and it's in the box, as it were, and it's a good framework for that. There's also Thinfinity's Virtual UI by Cyblosoft and Unigui by FM, FM, or, uh, FMSoft. Those two to actually come kind of from a different approach. We'll talk about those in detail here in a second. And then another one, there's two more that use a Delphi-like ID to design the UI and then an object, a transpiler, are SMS and Elevate Web Builder, which we mentioned earlier. So A to Z was originally talked about as the VCL for the web. It's kind of what they called it. It's been around for a while. It's the standard edition ships with Delphi and C++ Builder, but then they also offer an ultimate edition with some additional features from A to Z directly. One thing about uh, IntraWeb, because it has been around for a while and because it is a uh, ships with the product, is it's supported by some of the third parties like TMS. And so... If you're like, hey, this is it, it, interwebs great, but I wish I had a component that did this or did that or whatever, you go out to TMS and like, oh, look, TMS has got this whole suite of components that really expands what I can do with it. Um, so we have documentation on the doc in the doc wiki, and then also during Code Rage 11, we had a great session by Olaf on uh, interweb and bootstrap. So take a look at this we replay here, uh, modern interweb that shows how to build modern web applications using bootstrap, which is a another JavaScript framework <laughs> that I didn't include in my list above, which is by Twitter. It's kind of a JavaScript HTML framework to build really uh, reactive JavaScript applications. Actually, let's go ahead and do a demo right now.
So big fan of bootstrap. Uh, Bruce is yes. Bootstrap is a really big, big popular system. All right. So let's build a interweb application. So I'm going to go here, new other and find interweb here. And we choose which we want to build an interweb web application as opposed to a D unit test project for interweb, which is kind of cool that you can build a unit tests for your uh, interweb application. Now it's going to ask us a few questions here about the application we want to build. The standalone application is going to build an exe that you run, and that exe has the web server built into it with uh, Indie sockets, or an Asapi extension. An Asapi extension, you build it, and it gets installed into uh, Internet Information Server (IIS), and you um, to be used that way. And then you also have options for how you want to set up the data pooling or thread pool, et cetera. So I'm just gonna build this one here and we'll call it uh, project one interweb. One thing I noticed, uh, this dialog doesn't go out and look in the folder to see if project one is a name that's available. So you have to uh, be aware of that yourself. So you're gonna get this dialog, either you can, unless you say, remember my selection. And it's just saying, is this a VCL or is this a fire monkey? So we're gonna say, yeah, it's VCL, even though it's actually interweb, but it makes it happy because remember it's VCL for the web, right? All right, so we have a design surface here. Uh, this is a like a data module. This is a session unit, but we're really going to focus on the design surface here. So over here in the tool palette, we have um, some interweb components. So not interbase, intraweb. I yeah, intraweb, I-N-T-R web. I thought it was, I saw the E there and I got confused. I was like, oh no, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> um, so here, so here's authentication components, control components. Here's components for dealing with data. And we're going to look at standard right now. Kind of give you an idea of some of the stuff you can do here. So I'm going to build my favorite demo application. So we're going to take a, a list. So this is like a list box. And one thing is you're gonna notice it doesn't render here in the brow in the design surface. It's just this uh, box. And that's because it is rendered completely in JavaScript and HTML, and there is no JavaScript HTML rendering on the design surface here, but it gives us a nice placeholder. We're gonna build put an edit box down here and a button. And actually, I'll tell why. One of the reasons I was inspired to put this uh, webinar together here. Oh, how do you configure the colors in the tool palette? Uh, I love the colors in the tool palette. Come here, right click properties, which brings you to uh, environment options tool palette, and come here here to colors, and it changes the rainbow color scheme. Um, although it does rearrange these checkboxes when you do that, so you have to come back and change checkboxes back to like you want it. But it's very configurable. Um, some people use like the larger button sizes and stuff like that. I like the small ones. But uh, anyway, there you go. I like a little more color in there. So well, one of the reasons I was inspired to um, to do this is because uh, I was at a developer group. It was a general purpose developer group talking about all sorts of things. And that specific day, they are talking about JavaScript frameworks. And this guy was up there talking about all these different frameworks. and oh my goodness, it was a headache. He's like, oh, well, if you wrote this with this framework, well, that framework got end of life to now we're moving on to this framework and this framework uses a different approach and it was just like, wow, this is a can of worms. <laughs> and so after the meeting's over, a friend of mine was there that was a long time Delphi developer and he's like, oh, I need to build a web application because I need to uh, expose some stuff on the web. And I'm thinking about using that JavaScript framework you talked about. I'm like, well, why don't you just use uh, Intraweb or Thinfinity or uh, Unigui. And he's like, I've never heard of any of these. I'm like, they're these really powerful frameworks for building web applications with Delphi. So you don't have to go learn this JavaScript can of worms. Anyway, so we've got, this is the the standard Delphi um, demo application, right? So we have the, the edit box, the button, and the list box. A little different because the Interweb edit boxes buttons and list boxes. So we'll go to the button here and we're gonna write some Delphi code here. Although you could do this in C++ as well. And we'll say uh, IW list dot 
items. So just like we would in Delphi, add because we're in Delphi. So they're they're based on VCL, and we're gonna say IW edit one dot text, and it'll say IW edit one dot clear. All right. So now we can run this. So I'm gonna run this, and this is our standalone server that it built here. So we could change it to be the uh, ISAPI module where it would be deployed into ISAPI, but for debugging, this is a really quick, really easy way to turn things around. Uh, you can a few settings and tools you can do from here, but I'm just gonna click this Chrome icon and it's gonna launch my web browser here. Uh, for some reason, it takes a second the first time to launch the web browser. I think it's something wrong, something with my Chrome because it was doing this with other some other tools as well. Come on, there we go. All right, so here we go. We've launched it, um, and from here I can tap the button and it adds it to list. I can say, "Hello, webinar, web, and add it to the list." Round trip. So this is something I'll point out here. When I tap this button, it reloads the page. You can see this by right there. Hello. So watch right here. Hopefully you can see it. It reloads the page. And so what's happening is it's posting this form back to the server. You can view page source here and see there is some JavaScript here, but it is posting the form back to the server and the server is doing the processing and then sending it back down to the client. Okay, uh, there are some additional interweb samples, uh, but the, uh, so there's a question here about does interweb create reactive pages? Right here, check out this video. And it's gonna talk about how to build reactive web pages using, uh, uh, what's it called? Bootstrap. Okay, so if you're interested in reactive web pages with, with Interweb, take a look at that URL there. Actually, can I? Let's just do this. I'll go here and I'll copy this. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Hold up. Wrong button. All right. And reactive web pages, and I'll paste this in here so that you can grab that. Um, if you go to community.embarker.com, I meant to put the URL in here to begin with, that you can actually access all my slides. So if there is a URL you need to get to or whatever, just go there to community.embarker.com, and there's a blog post that has all my slides on it, so you can grab those from there. Okay, interweb. It's in the box, very powerful. It's very focused on... Um, the round trip, although there are a number of uh, extensions out there for it that will let you make it more reactive, uh, more Ajax. Ajax is the idea of when you make a change to the web page, you can post to the, uh, like a side socket without reloading the entire page. So uh, take a look at interweb. The question, does someone have access to the uh, canvas of the window for doing VCL type graphics, drawing bitmaps, lines, rectangles, etc.? Yes. That's well, that's a feature of interweb. So when you're doing interweb development, you're not writing the JavaScript in HTML directly, but a interweb component may have that functionality. So you could have a interweb component that adds, uh, for example, if you go here to like, for example, TMS software, oops, helps I spell this right. I totally destroyed that. <laughs> I'm glad Google figured that out. Uh, interrupt component pack. So this adds CC, like you have images, uh, all sorts of cool things you can do here. So this really goes beyond, so there you go, uh, beyond what you would do with uh, traditional HTML components. So this goes beyond the traditional HTML components, two types of components that are drawn. Uh, okay, so does the interweb support CSS? Uh, yes, it does. Windows Server only right now, correct. Um, Linux is coming, 
So I suspect it happens at that point. And then Robert's pointing out it does support Ajax out of the box, just depends on which on click event. Oh, that's right, it does. There is a different on click event. Async click right here. So async click is going to happen um, happen in the uh, is it is the uh, J, J, the what's it called? Here, let's just do this. And now run this. And there we go. Oh, is that not running? Oh, it's under report. Okay. Uh, so now. Oh, I didn't put anything in there. All right. Um, apparently, I did something wrong there. But anyway, uh, it does support uh, a JavaScript or Ajax. Take a look at the documentation. Apparently, I messed something up. Uh, that's what happens when I do it live. Um, so, let's see, there's some questions here about. Let's see. Okay, so uh, I was showing it in Google Chrome. Can you set up for other browsers? Yes, I just only have uh, um, right here. If I just click this button here, it's just going to launch an Internet Explorer. So all this is doing is what browser is launched to connect to it, but uh, it's all server side. The server is generating everything and gets sent down to the client. So it's completely, well, it's not going to, you don't have to worry about what browser it's supporting. Uh, it's able to figure that out all on its own. Uh, no example was I built with interweb. Oh, I can't think of one offhand. I know there are. I know a lot of people use interweb, but I just can't think of any examples of it right now. Uh, Alf's asking for Apple fanatics and their plans to support Apple servers. I really don't think so because uh, Apple servers, Apple's, I, yeah, Apple servers are really uh, not. Uh, very common <laughs> and tend to be more expensive. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any plans to support Apple servers. Although um, A to Z could support Apple servers, you could build something at Apple servers because we do have um, a Mac OS X compiler, so you could certainly build that if you wanted to. Uh, is interweb single user? No, it's not. It should have separate uh, users available to you to... Uh, uh, to, to to different things. Okay, here is a question here. Check out CG Dev Tools. Good tip. If you do have any tips of things I'm missing here, certainly feel free to uh, add them here. Is interweb in the Linux preview? Jerry is asking if inter interweb is in the Linux preview. Jerry, if you're interested in that, you need to get an update subscription and join the Linux preview. <laughs> uh, it's because it's under NDA and I can't talk about it, except for the fact to tell you to go join it. Uh, do, 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 do. All right, let's go on here. Um, so Unigui by FM Soft. So what this one does is kind of like interweb, I think, although I think it kind of extends on what interweb does. It lets you, it builds both the client and the server. It does the SAPI module, standalone servers, Windows services, etc. cetera. Uh, designed to be very scalable. It's built on the uh, Sencha EXT JS framework. Um, so let's take a look at Unigui, which you can find here at unigui.com. Let's just close this. So let's build a new other Unigui for Delphi. And we're just going to do the application wizard. And again, it's going to ask us a few questions here on how to get set up and get going. And we'll just call it Project One UG. And again, standalone server, Windows service, uh, SAPI module, et cetera, options. And again, it's going to ask us this question, so we should say yes. All right, so now we have our design surface. This 
is uh, a VCL design surface, so I could actually drop VCL components on it, but they wouldn't work because this it needs to be. I need to drop on uh, Unigui components in order for them to render for the browser. So Unigui standard. Let's do the same sort of thing here. We're going to do the list box. the edit box and the button and again we're going to double or go to the button here uh, it has an ajax event as well as a click event i'm going to go ahead and use the click event this time list or that's the biggest thing i found is Yes, I'm writing Delphi code, but it's easy to uh, start trying to reference a list. What's going on here? Apparently, I need to build something. One dot. Oh, list box. Ah, yeah. That's, that's what I'm going to say, is that I, some of the naming conventions are a little different, and so sometimes it throws me off. List box, items, not create, add, uni, edit one, dot, text, and then we're going to say uni, clear. And so now we'll run this. Address writing use. Oh, apparently I have it running from earlier. Break. All right, let's do this again. Allow access to the firewall. Uh, if I was doing it as an Asafi module, then it wouldn't be running the uh, binding to the socket. So it's running now. It's down here in my system tray. I can go here and look and see. There it is. It's running. And I'll go to my browser, which I need to open a new instance of the browser up. And we'll go to the uh, thing here. So I'm using the evaluation copy. So it says things for evaluating. And I say, OK. So here we go. It's created. See, there's our form right there that I just put down. So it's made it. It's kind of its own form. There's a lot of, uh, which is kind of interesting paradigm. And I can go here and I can hit the button and add to the list and say, hello world, and add to the list. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at some of the samples that come with Unigui here. Unigui demos desktop. Let's go for the all feature demo, right? Oh, yeah, already running. No. Uh, question about when and where will the replay of this webinar be available? <clears throat> the goal is to have available this week and will be available on the community site. Um, I have the URL. I'll just grab the URL for you real quick since you're asking about it now. The URL for it will be right there. Okay. So let's run this one here. Apparently, I could I shut on the other one? Oh, no, I didn't. Dang it. <laughs> shut down the old one. Shut down. Now I'll run it without debugging. Uh, the demos I'm showing are built in or ship with this demo I'm showing it ships with Unigui. So when you download Unigui from the website using the trial version, you will get this uh, sample here, except for the little uh, list box one I added myself. Okay, so here we go. This is the uh, all features demo. It has a lot of uh, different things in here. So here's database one. So here we go, database lookup combo box. So we can, uh, here, just seeing some 
data access. Lots of uh, data access here. Uh, we got so the cool thing is is that you're writing this. It's going to be similar to the way you would do a VCL application. It's based on that. Uh, it's just using a different set of controls. And then when you're done, you have a web application. Uh, master detail. Uh, here's HTML5 canvas. I was asking about that earlier. So I can draw on the canvas, draw a circle, uh, draw a rectangle, draw a line. Or just put that down a random spot. Anyway, so there you go. There's some uh, canvas stuff. Uh, is Unigui responsive? Uh, it does have stuff for being responsive. Oops. This demo is not. Let's see if I have one of sample I can load up that is more responsive. Uh, shut down. I don't see an example that does that, but it does have the ability to be responsive applications as well. All right, so I was going to go in here to the database. Let's see. Master detail. So see we have a client data set and data source you're already familiar with, so you can use any, any data set you want to use. And then here is the Unigui DB grid. Uh, so pretty much similar to how you would normally do your master detail type application development. It's just um, done with, like I said, different controls. So it's going to take the exact same skills you're using and then um, allow you to, to build them for the web. OK, is any plugin needed to use Unigui on the client side? No, it's completely in the browser. Everything I'm showing you today is completely in the browser. There's no special plugins on the client side. Uh, really, really, the way JavaScript is developed today is really that you can write a plugin in JavaScript. And so the uh, Unigui uses the Sencha JavaScript framework that lets it uh, build all that functionality in the client side. I have a, know a lot of people that love Unigui and use it quite a bit. Uh, lots of uh, Unigui support tree views. Okay, let's look. Oh, I just shut down. I believe it does, yes. Let's look. Uh, design. Unigui. Uni. Tree view. Unigui tree view right there. So, yes, Unigui supports tree view. Would I recommend Unigui for a bigger audience, 400 users plus on WebServe server? Um, I don't have any experience with that. I know I have talked to people that have used Unigui for very large uh, installations. So your mileage may vary, but I certainly believe it's possible. And a lot of it's going to come down to how you design it and how secure these frameworks are. So the Censure framework that Unigui uses is actually a, a third party maintains this. Let's see. Yeah, Sencha. So uh, these guys are maintaining it, so it's not like it's some abandonware someplace. It's uh, a very powerful framework that is being maintained and updated constantly. So I can't testify to how secure it is, but it should be fairly secure. Uh, you have to do some research on your own for that as far as discovering how secure that is. Uh, there is some inherent, uh, always in some inherent things with that when you think pulling in frameworks, uh, especially JavaScript frameworks and Java frameworks. Java, Java is more so than JavaScript. Java is a lot more, has a lot more security issues, but uh, probably should be fairly secure. Okay. Let's go on to the next one here. 
So Unigui, FM Soft, check it out. Pretty cool. It uh, similar to Interweb, but uh, some additional features on top of that. So Thinfinity Virtual UI. This one's kind of an interesting supro- approach. Uh, one thing about this is there is a developer license and a server license. So server license is based on number of concurrent users. And what this does is it redirects the GDI and GDI plus calls to a JavaScript client. Okay, so when someone connects to your uh, Thinfinity application, they get a, a JavaScript client is downloaded, and that JavaScript client then uh, receives the. Uh, it's like a, it's almost like a remote desktop approach, except it's uh, doesn't require a special client install. So let me show you this in action. Uh, one of the big claim to think or big uh, differentiating feature is single line of code convert your existing application FireMonkey or VCL into web application using uh, Thinfinity Virtual UI. So I'm going to open a sample project here. This is a sample project that ships with uh, ships with Delphi, and Thinfinity also works with C++ Builder. Okay, so I'm just going to open the sample project. The sample project is not a, at all aware of Thinfinity. It's just a standard VCL application. I can run this. And it runs here on Windows. Okay, can change styles, and there we go. Uh, okay, you've probably seen this one before. Toggle switch, new component for Windows 10. But then I can just come in here, and uh, shoot, I don't remember the name of the. There's a unit you have to add in here, and I can't remember where it is. I had this when I was going through and trying all this stuff out, but then totally spaced it when I was doing this. Okay, uh, Thinfinity Virtual UI documentation, so now I can show you how to use the documentation. Getting started. Uh, uh, adapting the application. Okay, compiling and testing Delphi application, right there. Auto run. I, saw, I, saw, I think it was auto something, but I was going to probably do it but the other way around. Someone probably already typed this in the help section because I'm sure some of you out there love uh, Thinfinity. So all I have to do is add that there to the um, to the uses clause and run this. And I ran it in debug mode. And since I ran it in debug mode, it's going to pop up and say, hey, you're running in debug mode. Let's start the web brow- the web mode. So I say start browser. Okay, now a couple of things that are a little weird here is, um, all right, so here, this is, that is the, so this is kind of weird. This here is the Windows application. This is the web application. All right, now, uh, when you're running this in the deployed server mode, this is virtualized and you can't see it. It's, it's hidden behind the scenes and only the user sees this. So there's no plugin required here. Um, this is all done via JavaScript. So there's it's completely JavaScript in here that then translates everything I do here to this. So there is a instance of this. Now, if you open a second uh server or second client connection to this, they'll get a spawn on a separate connect, separate instance of the uh, the client application. All right, so now in here, I can then interact with this and even change the styles. And there it is. So, oh, it hit it there with that, that one. Be, I would put it behind the other window. So, uh, so this, you'll see here when I do this, you'll see the uh, window pops up over here as well. That's a artifact of the fact I'm running in uh, basically like a debug mode and not a full deployment mode. But um, so the great thing about Thinfinity Virtual UI is let's say you do have an existing um, Delphi application that you want to expose to your uh, end users so that they can then interact with it. And uh, 
there you go. Th this will make turn any application into web application, uh, including database driven applications. It will uh, uh, it keeps the data in the cloud, and so every everybody's going to have a separate instance. So you need to make sure your application is able to run uh, multiple instances in the cloud or uh, on the server. So if your application assumes it's the only one on the machine, then that might have some create some issues for you. Uh, file system and registry is virtualized, so it should be should be good for the most part. Um, let's see, questions here. Are these things only available in the latest version of Delphi? So I'm only doing, including things that support the latest version of Delphi, Berlin. Some of these will support earlier versions, but not very far back, typically speaking. Uh, interweb probably supports the furthest back, if I were to guess. Uh, let's see... Okay, so Charles is saying I've installed Berlin Update 2, but I don't see these. So uh, this is uh, Thinfinity, so you have to go to uh, Cyberly Soft and download Thinfinity in order to see this sample. And uh, same thing with if you want to see the Unigui one, you have to go to unigui.com to download that Unigui uh, framework. So these are uh, third-party frameworks. The interweb is all built into Delphi. So if you only have Delphi and you just want to use what comes with it, take a look at Interweb. Um, and there's you can check out the doc, doc wiki on that right here, Interweb doc, for more information on how to use Interweb um, as well. Let's see. Uh, Jeff's saying because uh, WebFMX, which is another one, and Thinfinity um, does screen grabbing, it has poor load times. I found... I was on a uh, slow internet connection. I was trying to connect to WebFMX, which I didn't include here. Uh, that's one thing. This is by no means a complete list. So uh, WebFMX, which should also be on this list here, lets you, uh, does the same sort of thing. It was slow. I was on my phone on a really slow connection. And it was very, very slow to load because it, it assumes a certain level of richness and it doesn't degrade well. So this is really a, a virtualization, like a remote desktop type approach. And uh, what about printing support in virtual UI? That's a good question. Um, how does that work? Let's see if there's a component for that. I know there's components to extend it beyond just the... Uh, hmm. I don't see anything on that. Uh, don't have the documentation open. Miguel, let's go take a look at the documentation for uh, Virtual UI and see if they have anything on there on how to print locally from the from there. Because um, clearly you would need to, to change where that, that's going to because you wouldn't want to print on the remote server. Good question. Um, Okay. Oh, Jeff saying Thinfinity has printing. Good to know. I seems like I saw that, but it's one of those things I've looked at a lot of these uh, for how the, how they go. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's look at Elevate Web Builder. Uh, Elevate Web Builder. It's, it's a standalone IDE with its own designer and transpiler. Uh, it has free trial and commercial license available. It supports connecting data snap servers and other databases as well. So you can take a look at that one here. Let's look at that one in action. Oh my goodness, it's already 8 o'clock. Well, 8 o'clock for me, so top of the hour. Um, Elevate Web Builder. So this is its own standalone IDE. Uh, it always gives me this error message, but it seems to work just fine. <clears throat> so let's Close all. Make sure I'll just open this one up. This is a sample project I made earlier. Um, why isn't this switching back to the... There you go, form view. So uh, this is a Delphi-like IDE. It's not... We're not no longer in Delphi or Rad Studio. It's back there. But you can still do things like put down components. You have an object inspector, etc. Uh, it does have uh, components for connecting to uh, databases as well as to data snap. And uh, so here I built a simple application. When you run it, it runs it in, has a built-in browser for a quick turnaround time. Why 
why isn't this running? Oh, run. I have to go here. Run, run. Okay, so it's running it inside the browser here. And I just tap the button and it says hello. So here you're writing, uh, this is using a transpiler, right? So you're uh, writing your code in uh, Pascal in Delphi. And it then, oh, it's here. And this gets converted into JavaScript. Okay. So this is where you're going to leverage your skills, uh, your ability to work with Delphi, Object Pascal, et cetera. And it's going to behave similarly, but it's building a web application via a transpiler. They have a lot of samples. I'm going to kind of skim through this. If you want to take a look at this, you can download the sample for this one as well. Um, Smart Mobile Studio, SMS. So they originally, uh, Smart Mobile Studio started out as a mobile solution, but it's really migrated. It still does mobile through a uh, phone gap, but it's really more focused on uh, cloud development. Um, you can take a look at that through Smart Mobile Studio. And I was going to show a sample of that as well, but since we're already after the hour, I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. Uh, did demonstrations already. A couple other frameworks you can check out. A Radius framework. The, it's a freeware without source. WYSIWYG virtual visual ID doesn't support latest version, so uh, it did not include that. And Kitto is a uh, builds rich internet applications based on data modules. So you point it to a data module and it builds a uh, a framework for Cloud Explorer. You can take a look at some of the demos online there. Okay, so now we're going to go to uh, questions. If there are any questions I didn't get or other questions I didn't cover, go ahead and put them in here. Um, so. There's some questions here about uh, Embarcadero's web solution. So we have um, Web Builder and Interweb are both provided part of our uh, part of the package that you buy. These are some other ones as well, third-party solutions uh, that you can take a look at that add some additional functionality. So uh, yeah, I, I can't speak about long-term roadmap, but there are there is discussions for sure in product management. And you can certainly talk to someone on product management if you want some more uh, some more information about that. Uh, let's see, printing virtual UI. Yes, it does do printing. Thinfinity. Uh, da, da, da. Tell us more about the performance of Thinfinity on the server side. Um, I don't know about the performance of Thinfinity on the server side. I've seen um, some things that use that. Actually, let me bring up WebFMX. I can't believe I totally forgot that. Web FMX. Also by Cyberly. Okay. Um, see, I don't know. I can't really speak to the performance on that, unfortunately. Where is... Oh, it's right. I closed the thing. So, uh, see each of these up here. This is somebody, one of you, viewing this. So, cool. Glad you're out here viewing the slides. Uh, here's the link to get to the, the slides, and the replay will be available there as well. It's web FE for f uh, front end, web front end webinar. Uh, FE also is iron, chemical element for iron, but uh, in case you forget, it's web iron webinar. <laughs> All right, that's probably just too geeky. Uh, let's see. Best responsive for, like, bootstrap. I would take a look at... If you're wanting to go bootstrap responsive, take a look at this right here, this uh, interweb bootstrap code rage session, because it's really cool. It does some great stuff. Uh, I thought about just playing a clip of that because it's pretty neat, but wanted to keep it all new and then just point you to this URL. So take a look at this one here. Olaf does a great job showing you how to build responsive modern websites with uh, interweb. How to get a copy of slide presentation. It is, yeah, I just gave you the URL for that, showed the URL for that. There's the URL, webfe webinar, embt.co slash webfe webinar. Radius is discontinued. That's kind of what I thought that uh, looked like it was discontinued. Uh, like I said, it wasn't updated for the latest version. Um, is there likely to be web assembly support for Delphi in the future? Interesting idea. Uh, feel free to make a feature request at qualityembarcadero.com and uh, let product management know how important that is to you. 
what's the most responsive performance wise? Uh, so the, the the thing with that is different things going to be different performance for different things. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Web broker is probably your most responsive for performance because it is the simplest. It has the least moving parts, the least overhead to it. Uh, all of these other ones are going to add a little bits of overhead, which gives you more functionality, but because of that overhead, you're going to lose a little bit of performance. Now, uh, that being said, when you start using something like Bootstrap to make a responsive system, you gain some uh, performance with that, so it's a trade-off. So it's really hard to say what's the most performant one. I would suggest if you're uh, wanting the most performance, take a look at IntraWeb with the Bootstrap, the, the Code Rage session I pointed to by Olaf. That's going to be a great place to get started. It's going to have some really good uh, stuff in there. Um, yeah, it, it, it really depends on what you're doing. There's so many permutations of possibilities of things you can do that one is not necessarily going to be way more performant than the other. Uh, it's probably going to be pros and cons with all of them. All right. Hello from Colombia. Goodbye from Ireland. Thanks for everybody joining us. A few of you have jumped off already because we are past the hour. Sorry about that. Uh, one of the things with doing this live is it tends to run a little long, apparently. Um, Going to get a little look at Interweb again. Haven't tried it in years. Cool. Yeah, the Bootstrap one, very interesting. Take a look at that webinar there that Olaf did. He always does a great job. Um, how many clients can connect to interweb app? If your interweb app is a standalone, you're not going to get as many connected to it. But if it's in a SAPI module, then you're going to be able to get a lot connected to it. It's way more scalable as in a SAPI module uh, for various reasons. So always in production, you want to go to an SAPI module and not just use a standalone uh, server. Okay, I said always, but there may be reasons you want to go with the standalone server, and there may be sometimes you can get some performance out of that. Generally speaking, go with an SAPI module uh, or an Apache module if it supports Apache module. Someone's asking about RIM objects. Uh, I haven't looked at RIM objects in a while. They don't really do anything in this space here uh, that I'm aware of, so I don't know if it's really, really relevant. Um, I know that... Um, like SMS supports room object SDK, I think, as far as consuming a room object SDK, SDK server. But beyond that, I don't really see how it would be be useful. Um, okay. Wow, lots of great questions here. Uh, hopefully I got most of them answered. Uh, lots of positive feedback. Great to hear. Glad everybody enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully the uh, live webinar was... Uh, still useful without being as tightly edited as usual. So great. Thank you everybody for joining us. And hopefully you take a look at some of these web frameworks and find one that works for you in building your web solution to get into the browser. Thanks so much. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye.